So uh, don't hesitate to stop and to ask a question. I think that we should be more interactive because otherwise it's not fun. Um, I'm, uh, this is my conflict of interest. So what you know already, but about 80% of uh, strokes are ischemic and uh, among those, 80% of ischemic strokes are related to a carotid uh, territory. And, um, and the main cause that are related to carotid artery are, include thromboembolism of the bifurcation and embolism after in the middle cerebral artery. So it's a real problem. And uh, you all, all, of know, all of you know the presentation of symptomatic carotid disease, EMI motor and uh, sensory signs. A transient uh, mon monocular blindness is equivalent to a TIA. I mean, it's a TIA, okay. It's as a TIA with a cerebral uh, disease. Other cortical dysfunction are the dysphagia, visual, spatial ne ne neglect. The important thing, and I will come yeah, back. Yeah, the important thing, and I will come back on this many times, and it's perhaps the only thing to bring home for my uh, show. It is that it has been shown that once a patient has TIA, in relation with the 50 to 99% carotid stenosis, the risk of stroke at 48 hours is between 5 to 8%, and the risk of stroke at, during the first week is as high as 22%. So a patient with a, a TIA is in some way an emergency. It, uh, it was not considered as such by many people until, until uh, the recent year, but it is an emergency. And I, I will go back on this because I think it's very important. So uh, any patient with a suspected TIA should be assessed and imaged within 24 hours by a specialist physician and, if possible, in an acute stroke unit. Now, every specialist who is dealing with carotid stenosis doing the duplex, by example, should tell the GP or the, and the patient about the method he used to make the measurement of a carotid stenosis because there are two methods. And I think it's very important because the two methods doesn't give the same result. So, so the patient is symptomatic and what what are the means? How are you going to investigate this, this patient? So you have a duplex, the catheter angiography that was described uh, before, magnetic uh, MRI, CTA, and we have to compare with this method. So the first thing is when you do a duplex or when you do angio or CT, you have to uh, say which method you use. So the NASET method, I'm always good at that, the NASED method is shown here. So you make the ratio about the, the diameter, the, the opening of a stenosis on the diameter of a distal internal carotid artery. And this is the method that is more and more used. The CST was used in the beginning because you make the ratio on the a stenosis to the diameter of the internal carotid artery or location of a stenosis. So it's more, uh, it was uh, interesting because when you do a duplex, it's something very easy to do. But the method that is more, more used now is the NASA criteria. So, and this is very important, you have a duplex ultrasound criteria for NASA stenosis measurement. So you have here, the stenosis according to the NASET, less than 50, 50 to 69, 60 to 69, 70, etc., etc., until near occlusion. You are here, the duplex ultrasound with uh, peak systolic velocity of the internal carotid artery, and the ratio of the peak systolic velocity of the internal carotid on the peak systolic velocity of the common carotid artery. And uh, you have also St. Mary ratio. Well, I, I will not go into details about this, but still, I mean, you see that there are a lot of difference. 
So it's clear that when you are looking for stenosis above 70%, you have you know, no knowledge of what is going on. And this is NASET criteria. It's not ECSD. Now, the catheter and geography is the other method that could be used. It was previously the gold standard in carotid imaging, but however, it has been shown in uh, ACAS trial in asymptomatic patients to be associated with a risk of stroke as high as 4%. And uh, in symptomatic patients, it's, you know, it's not acceptable anymore. So it's no longer part-time of a routine workup for TIP patient. In your, in your experience, you use, still use uh, angiography in this patient, in symptomatic pay patient? No. Okay. Right, just the yeah, 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 yeah. This is another, this is part of a procedure. Yeah. Actually, in that case, you... Uh, there we go. But you have... Uh, you, you, Ajani, you, you um, also injected in the uh, right common carotid. Yes. Why, why, why did you do that? Because... I mean, that's an additional risk that is it's not really uh, motivated. So maybe the side that you are going to treat is... If you, if you don't have uh, non-invasive data before... Yeah, you should have. <laughs> if you have invasive data, I fully agree. If you don't have invasive data... I yeah. The polygonal wheel is, uh, should okay. be assessed before. There are other questions? No? Okay. So we move on. Now, MRI use uh, the paramagnetic agent, the gadolinium, and uh, it enables the high resolution ima ima imaging of the arch to the circle of wireless. If it is well done, you can see a lot with MRI. And it's, so p it's also possible in dedicated centers when people are interested in what they do to analyze the plaque itself. And uh, you can have a vulnerable, a vulnerable plaque with a signal, say, say, uh, signal intensity or a ratio that you can analyze. So it's a it's not a bad examination. However, it is uh, limited by its availability. There are countries, hospitals, where it's not really uh, available in emergency. Uh, it is in very some patient incompatibility with a pacemaker. There is a problem of claustrophobia. And the form of a gadolinium is identified as a cause of uh, uh, nephrogenic systemic necrosis in some patient with a pre-existing uh, renal uh, impairment. And finally, the computer angiography, CTA. So CTA is, very, is uh, easy, accessible, it's minimally invasive, even if you have uh, your radiation, and it allows uh, anatomical imaging with, with short scan time, you have thin slides, you, can, uh, you have cross-sectional data, you can reformat your exam in many planes with a 3D analysis. And we have learned to use uh, CTA since uh, the development of EVAR because we, we uh, review all our CT with uh, special dedicated programs and you can now do the same for carotid bifurcation. And you see exactly how is the stenosis, how tight it is. However, there is a thing that you don't have. It's the dynamic information, but you have got it with a duplex. Okay. And the other thing is that AV calcification can increase the difficulty to estimate the stenosis. So it's not perfect, but, you know, uh, when we were making a guidelines with Victor and uh, with Ross, Ross for the European and Victor for the European Society for Cardiology, we realize that, we, we think, we recommend that we need more than one, one uh, imaging technique before you embark the patient on treatment. So most of the, peop most of the people now start with a duplex, and then they, whether they choose to do another du du uh, duplex done by somebody else, because it's operator dependent, or most of the time, in my practice, we move on CTA, and with both examination, you know exactly where we are, where you are, what is the degree of stenosis, and I think it's 
the way to go uh, now. You have some uh, question about this? Maybe we, we can ask if... Uh, Af after? People, yeah, no, but even now. Yeah. If, if anybody here feels patient with carotid stenosis, yes. maybe you can uh, raise your hands. If you treat patients with carotid stenosis, nobody? Someone, yeah, okay. <laughs> so your practice, do you do just one uh, assessment? Uh, just a duplex. I make the diagnosis. I make the diagnosis and send it to the vascular surgeon. But you make the di diagnosis on the by ultrasound. On the ultrasound, ultrasound, and then it takes he takes care of the patient. He does a CT angio. Okay. Okay. So usually, yeah, CT angio. Uh, Professor Peiko of Macedonia. Uh, we are from the group from Professor Kedov, who is doing the uh, lots of carotid stenosis intervention. So usually in Macedonia, in our center, we're doing first the ultrasound and after that the CT angio on all of the patients before treatment. Mm -hmm. And we treat the patient, most of them, with uh, stents. Okay. No more? We, we move? May, may I just add yep. one, one detail to that? Actually, what we do is ultrasound and CTA in each and every patient. Why is that? Because there are some standalone internal carotid arteries without anterior or posterior um, communi communications, and this is highly decisive how you then treat the patient. So I think the combination of ultrasound as well as CTA is the ideal uh, setup to, uh, to, 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 have an, uh, to be ahead of the game for the entire anterior and posterior uh, circulation. Yeah, you are perfectly right. Mm -hmm. So um, when you do a, a, a meta-analysis of uh, accuracy of imaging, so uh, it's shown here, and I have a. I want to stress this. This examination, so you have here the degree of stenosis. I don't know if you see this in the back of a room. It's a little too small, perhaps. And you have here the technique of imaging. You have a sensitivity and the specificity of examination. So there is not much di much discussion for very tight stenosis, or for. Uh, complete occlusion, of course, and a low degree of stenosis. But you see that there are the difference in, the, uh, in this meta-analysis concerning the sensitivity and specificity when you have a stenosis between 50 to 69%. And I think it's a reason, it's further reason to, to duplicate the dust, uh, the, the, the duplex, and to do the, the, the CTA, to, uh, you have two examination, because yeah, you have a very good specificity here, a bad sensitivity, but with a CTA you can you can, you, you see more, and you can if you combine both a examination, you are good. The same ray is a contrast under uh, on those MRI seems to be the best examination. However, these studies, uh, this studies, this resist come from very dedicated centers with a radiologist who is highly competent in MRI with reconstruction, etc., etc. So it's not the experience of most of the centers. Yep. Just one question. Um, could you please go to the other slide? Uh, why is it so important just to uh, be very sensitive uh, in the range of 50 to 69? Um, because the, the sensitivity in the really strong stenosis is much better for the Doppler ultrasound, for example. Yeah, but the, the, uh, I think it's very important to stress this because in many cases with patients in real life, uh, the very tight stenosis and the very moderate stenosis are not a problem because, you know, it's very tight. Everybody agrees. You see it on CT. You have a, it's evident on, on duplex. And if the patient is symptomatic, is symptomatic, you have to do something. Now, in a range of around 50 to 69, first, the benefit of surgery is not so, well, it's significant, but not so great, okay, first. So the choice to embark the patient on surgery, on a, any kind of revascularization, is a decision that should be discussed. And if you have a, a, a duplex ultrason 
with a sensitivity of 36%, even the specificity is high. I mean, you, you can hesitate to, to, uh, to make your, your, your decision. So I think it's important to stress that in this area of stenosis, the things should be discussed. I don't know if you have this experience in your practice, but uh, it is always between 50 to 69% that the things are not so clear. Um, Jean-Baptiste, it is very important to discuss about this intermediate um, situation because in these studies, they have to, to, to calculate a sensitivity, you, you calculate um, uh, true positives and false negatives. So it is a binary approach. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, um, a uh, velocity of 878, uh, you will say this is less than 8, 180, so this is not a stenosis. And if it's a 182, you will say there is a stenosis. So this is the limitation of this approach to really um, uh, quantify and the sensitivity and specificity. But what I would suggest to everybody is that we should no longer say there is a 50 or 55 or 60 percent stenosis. You should give a range, even in your in your uh, duplex um, uh, conclusion, because uh, even in we are we, we are used to make it every day. Uh, we still have some some overlaps. And I think that you may rather say 50 to 60 or 60 to 70 or whatever, rather than giving a specific measurement as sometimes radiologists do. Yeah, I agree. I think we can move. So now the, the management of these patients. So you know you have a, you, have the, you did your, your duplex, your CTA or other examination, and you have to take care of it. So uh, the first thing is, uh, the summary is here, best medical therapy. What, is, uh, what are the results of a ra ra randomized controlled trial? What are the results of uh, endarctectomy and uh, CAS, coronary artery stunting? Because we have a, ra a randomized trial too. And what's the problem about um, the emergency carotid uh, revascularization? So I will not go to, uh, I will not, you know, all patients with a symptomatic carotid stenosis uh, benefit from uh, the optimization of risk factor, statin therapy, and exclusion of important comorbidities. Everyone should have a EKG, a baseline blood test, you know, to uh, exclude uh, thrombocytosis, hyperlipidemia. But there are discrepancies among, among the guidelines regarding antiplatelet uh, therapy in, uh, in this in symptomatic patient. Most guidelines advocate uh, low dose aspirin, but uh, some studies, uh, I'm not speaking of CAS because the CAS needs a, a double antiplatelet therapy. It has been demonstrated in, in all the mass trial. But if uh, the patient goes for surgery, some, uh, some studies have shown that uh, double antiplatelet therapy can reduce the risk of uh, recurrent stroke immediately prior carotid endotomy. You know, period you wait from the diagnosis to the operation without increasing the, the risk of uh, the bleeding risk during operation. This is what, what I do, and uh, I think it can be interested. Uh, I would be interested uh, to have uh, your idea about the, uh, the antiplatelet strategies in this patient. Because we, 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 we use uh, aspirin and... Uh, I have a question. Um, you, if you're going to send somebody for surgery, uh, are you going to investigate him for coronary artery disease before you do that? Well, if a patient is, is uh, asymptomatic for coronary artery disease, you know, we, we just, we do an EKG, we ask the patient about the clinical sign. But if it is asymptomatic, it has been shown in the guidelines that there is no need to do, to do more, to do uh, investigation, coronary angiography, or things like this. It will not change the, uh, you know, the, um, the attitude, I think, that... Uh, uh, we have demonst we demonstrated this if if a patient is asymptomatic for the coronary disease. Shabatis, I will talk about this uh, later. There's okay. no evidence uh, that this are uh, uh, a good therapy to prevent ischemic uh, uh, stroke. 
So there is a large variation in terms of uh, dosage, dose of aspirin, mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of canopyridine uh, approach. So I think there's many things to, to, to do. There's not a standard treatment. Yep. As, as is shown by it, that the, the, the dosage in the US, use a, in the neurologists use habitually more than 300, um, 300 milligram per day. In Europe, we use a low dose aspirin. So there is no consensus. Yep. Other, quick, quick, other question about the medical treatment? No, okay. So we go, we move. Now, concerning the, the surgical treatment, some of you are young, you are hopefully young, and you don't, you don't re remember what happens uh, 25 years ago about uh, when the vascular, there, there was no endovascular treatment and the only, the only treatment for carotid stenosis, the only surgical treatment were, was on that dichotomy. And the neurologists in the United States say, well, keep saying that we as surgeons didn't know what we are doing and that uh, carotid endotomy was useless, dangerous for the patient. And there were papers pu pu published in the New England, in the Lancet about this, a bunch of them, and even in the, in the New York Times and uh, Chicago Times, etc., cetera, and the, and the Times, and every said that uh, this patient should not be operated, etc. So at the end, it was the end of a story, it was a two main or three main randomized controlled trial that were done and run by neurologists and vascular surgeons. The VA trial, the NASET in North America and the ECSC in Europe. So globally this trial were uh, incorporated more than 6,000 PP patients and solved the problem. So for the people, for the people that consider that randomized controlled trial are not anymore useful, I remind them that they were the key to make some progress in medicine, well, my opinion. So the trialist collaboration, the people that make this free trial put together the result of a trial. And the, the conclusion is that carotid endectomy is not indicated in symptomatic patients with a less than 50% NASET stenosis. Carotid endectomy confers significant be be benefit in recently symptomatic patient, less than six months, with uh, 50 to 69, and it uh, confers a maximum benefit for patient with symptomatic 17 to 99 uh, carotid stenosis, excluding those with a string sign. So I, I want just to, to explain to you what is a string sign, because it's a matter of uh, confusion. A string sign is not a very uh, severe stenosis where you have a, a pinhole stenosis. It's not. A, a, a string sign is a stenosis, but above the stenosis, you have a very uh, small carotid actate with a small diameter. And it means that because of a proximal stenosis, there is a thrombus in the carotid artery above, old one, but you don't, don't need, you, you don't have to operate this patient to revascularize this patient because they have a, they have a high risk of, of stroke because of embolize of a thrombus. This, this is the meaning of string sign. Um, so if you see in details here, it's quite clear. You have a NASET stenosis. You have a 30-day death and stroke after a carotid endotectomy. You have a five year, stro uh, year st of stroke in uh, best me medical treatment and carotid endotectomy. You have the absolute risk reduction in stroke at five years and you have a relative risk re reduction. So if you see a patient with a 50 to 69% stenosis at five years, you have a relative risk reduction of 28%, an absolute risk reduction of 7.8%, and it, it means that at five years, you avoid a stroke out of 1,000 patients in 78 of them. And you see that if you consider a, a symptomatic patient with a 70 to 99% stenosis, you have a relative risk reduction of 48%, an absolute risk reduction of 50%, and 
and you save among 1,000 per patient at five years 156 stroke, which is a lot. So it's, it works. And uh, uh, this, these are the result of a combined uh, trial. So there is no much discussion about this. But one, you have the best medical treatment here. And obviously, the best medical treatment 20 years ago is absolutely different to what we get now. So we should be very careful. But still, the difference is so high that these patients still need an operation. But the best medical treatment changed. The other thing is a delay of surgery. I told you in the beginning that this patient should be operated very quite quickly. And you see here that the absolute, you have an absolute risk reduction and the number of patients to treat to avoid a cardiovascular event in 1,000 patients here with the numbers. If you operate the patient within the first two weeks, you have a, uh, an absolute risk reduction of 40, more than uh, around 50, 15%, and you save this, this life. You avoid stroke in this number of patients out of 1,000. If you wait two, four weeks, it's lesser, 3.3% absolute risk reduction, and the number needed to treat is a big higher. Now, if you wait for four to 12 weeks, it's even worse. And if you wait for more than 12 weeks, there is no reason to, re to operate the patient. So I think the maximum be benefit regarding late stroke pre prevention is linked to the, to the time of surgery. The sooner, the better, in, in theory. If this was not the same in some years ago. People were they delayed surgery, but it's not the way to go. Now. You uh, should be careful also, because if you go quick, if you uh, do uh, quickly, you see that in this, uh, this is a uh, national audit of practice in UK and in Germany, this is fine. I mean, if you operate very quickly, the, the risk of perioperative risk of stroke is relatively stable, so it, the profit is better for the patient, so you have to do it. In one country, in Sweden, they find that in the first two days, the risk of stroke was very high and go down after and was absolutely quite okay, but not here. So what happens? You have an idea? Why in this uh, series in Sweden, the risk of uh, stroke was uh, so high in the first two days when you go and do the vascular surgery in emergency? Well, it's because you should not operate in emergency when you have uh, this sort of stroke with a brain infarct that's more than one third of the volume of the hemisphere. Because in this case, you have a risk of hemorrhage and death and worsening of a, of a patient. So it's common sense. If you have a patient with a TIA or mild stroke, ranking two, three, okay, tight carotid stenosis, you do the, uh, uh, the CT scan, MRI, and you see that there is a very limited infarct, then you have to go and to operate this guy very, very quickly. Now, if you have this kind, uh, this, this kind of patient, then you should wait. You should wait because if you operate in emergency, you have a risk of major hematoma, intracerebral hematoma, and hemorrhage. So I think it's a limitation of, a, of the quickness of the operation. But, you know, it's the importance to have a CTA in this patient. Uh, concerning uh, the comparison of uh, carotid stenting and uh, carotid anatomy, there are at least uh, four um, randomized controlled trials. Eva Fries, French, Space, ECSS, and Crest. And if you, um, if you look at the death and any stroke in the first 30 days, you see that there is a, a, a difference among CAS and uh, carotid endotectomy in symptomatic patients, because so, some of the studies mixed symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. So it's difficult to, but in, if you take just the subgroup of symptomatic patients, 
most of the time you have a double, you double the risk of death and stroke in, uh, when you do the, the standing. If you go through the disabling stroke or, or death, things are not so different. And if you go through the death, stroke, and MI, if you add MI, which has been highly criticism for the crest, there is no more difference between the two groups. But, you know, there is a huge difference between, uh, because in the, in the crest we introduce uh, just biological MI, MI with a rise of, uh, of the, uh, uh, in the biology and not, not a, a clinical MI like uh, we, we see m most of the time. So the problem is that if you do, if you have a, uh, a combined endpoint with death, stroke, and MI, you equal MI, any, any kind, type of MI, with a stroke. It's a huge difference. MI, you have an MI, you see a cardiologist, like uh, our friend, you see you, you have angiography, a stent, two days after you are home, because it's good, it's working fine, you, uh, you go to your job, you drive your car, you are okay with your family, you don't change, you don't lose your job, there is nothing wrong. If you have what they call a mild stroke, you are like this, you know, you, you cannot drive, you, half of them uh, lost their job, in a family it's a disaster, it's a real disaster. So you cannot make equal these two com com complications, a stroke is really a, uh, a disaster. And, and I think that this, uh, this combined um, uh, analysis of uh, rand randomized controlled trial clearly shown that uh, gas was not so good. It doesn't mean that it's not, it should not be, be, uh, be used. There are, there are some people who need carotid stunting. So we, these are the, the conclusion of the SCSVS guidelines on PAD, where you see that uh, occlusion, near occlusion, the string sign, and the carotid stenosis less than 50% is best me medical treatment. Carotid stenosis 50 to 69, class 2A is a surgery, or CAS may be considered in class 2BB, class 2EB, and then if a carotid standard is very tight, it's class 1A, and should be considered in high risk for carotid anatomy, it's 2AB, otherwise may be considered in 2BB. So everybody agrees on this, and I think it represents the, the real life. I, I'm showing you this because this is uh, what we find when we operate a patient with a tight stenosis, and you can imagine uh, why, uh, even if uh, interventionists are very skillful, I mean, it is uh, potentially uh, difficult to have no complication when you pass a catheter into this. And furthermore, if you do CAS uh, within the first day of symptoms, it even, um, is a, you, have, you take a significantly higher rate of death and stroke than carotid endotectomy. The good thing is that after the first 15 days, the stenting or carotidonectomy have the same result. The curves are parallel. So the difference between the two techniques are, in, you know, are technique they dependent. They are the first week. Uh, this is the same. OK, one important thing that you should have in mind is that uh, the, it's the incidence of new cerebral lesion when you do a CTA or when you do CAS or endotectomy. Because, you know, you are a surgeon, so you are, you are very proud of yourself. You operate the patient, the patient is okay, no, you know, no clinical deficit, fine. But in fact, in, this, in the ESS, there was an uh, MRI that was done on this patient after carotid endotectomy and CAS, and we found new lesion, new ischemic lesion, and uh, the, the number, the percentage was greater after CAS than say uh, 40% versus 12%, and this is highly significant, but still 12% with carotid endotectomy, you know. Uh, 
So I think that it is important to have in mind that when you put, when you do take care of this patient, uh, you should be careful. There's a drawback of surgery or, or cast be uh, because of this risk. Cartilidectomy, I will, I will go very quickly. Uh, first, you can do them in local regional anesthesia or general anesthesia. It doesn't change the risk of a surgery. This has been shown by the by a randomized control trial and Cochrane uh, review. Uh, the thing that you should be very careful and dedicated to this type of surgery, you should uh, have loops, uh, it's very important. You should uh, clamp first the, com the internal carotid artery, do heparin BB4, use a shunt when needed, but there is no clear recommendation on this. Um, uh, when it is done, you have to fix the, the limit of your dietectomy. You have a clean carotid and you, and, and you close it with, with a patch to avoid the restenosis. And I always do a compression and geography when I finish because sometimes you have occlusion. You, the internal carotid is fine, but you have air occlusion of the external. And if you have a flap on the external, you can have a clot that goes that, go up in the internal with a stroke. So we always did completion and geography, but this is not in your recommendation. It's open to, it's, uh, open to practice, and there is the different practice among vascular surgeons. I don't know what you are doing. Uh, Always completion NGO. Yeah. There are other surgeons? Yeah. 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 I agree with you. Better. Um, we, we find that the administration of clopidogrel two or two uh, days before surgery has been uh, recommended to lessen the risk of carotid thrombosis during surgery. You can operate on clopidogrel plus uh, aspirin. Uh, it's, not a pro it's not a problem. We have discussed about the completion and geography. When you operate this patient, there is a risk of perineal nerves uh, injury. It was. It is as high as 8%, if you, really, if you are really looking at it, uh, when you ask a vascular surgeon, say there are none, but it's, it's false, I mean, there are some. The good news is that uh, there are very, very, very few are permanent uh, or disabling, less than 2%. Um, one thing is very important. If you see a patient with a carotid stenosis who is symptomatic and needs, uh, we will need an operation, you should be aware if this patient had had a contralateral carotid endectomy or a neck dissection or a thyroidectomy, he must absolutely undergo, before surgery, a check for recurrent laryngeal and hypoglossal nerve function. Because if he has got a thyroidectomy and you cut the recurrent nerve on the right side, and if you operate the guy for a carotid on the left side, and if you have an injury of a recurrent nerve, you cannot take out the tracheostomy tube, and the patient can die. So it's a, it's a major complication, and I think if this happens, if uh, you have not done this checkup before, I mean, uh, you can go to, uh, to uh, jail. So, the surgeon is responsible, of course. But if you see the patient, think about it. It is uh, very important. And uh, if there is a, a nerve lesion of the contralateral side, I mean, it's, uh, you should think about the stenting, uh, obviously. Well, I mean, the operative stroke, I mean, it's not uh, very funny to describe. I mean, uh, if it is a thrombosis, it's within the six hours. Rare, but it happens. Uh, as you are, most of you are cardiologists, there is a very important thing in this patient when they go in the in the postoperative uh, room. I mean, you have to look at the arterial pressure, and you should be very careful about that because there is a what we call an hyperperfusion syndrome that can lead to intracranial hemorrhage. It's one or two percent of uh, carotid endotectomy. It happens with patients with headache, seizures, and if this happens, you have to be very active. There, is, there should be a protocol 
to treat the, this patient because when it happens at two o'clock in the morning in a ward, the nurse doesn't know what to do. The intern, if he's not so specialized in vascular surgery, is a little lost. But acute hypertension in this patient during the first five days is very important to look at. Rest analysis is low, around 10% at five years. When, they, when the, the patient became symptomatic with a recurrent stenosis, they should be operated like a new one. For CAS, I will go very quickly. It's very important to assess the suitability for CAS. Dual antley platelet therapy is a rule. CAS technique, I will not go in detail into this. Cerebral protection device and peripheral. So assessing the suitability of CAS. I think the specialist will tell us how important it is. I mean, it comes from the low bifurcation, tortuous carotid, carotid, aortic arch, penal stenosis, angulate field, the uh, origin of the internal carotid artery, occlusion of the external, so it can be a problem. And um, we work with neuroradiologists when there is an indication for CAS, and I see how careful they are. Uh, because uh, the patient that uh, People that do this are quite skillful, but you know, uh, many of the stroke occurred before they get in the internal carotid artery, it's in the aortic arch. So it's very important to see where you are going. Dual antiplastic therapy is okay. Stand design, it has been shown that uh, it's better to use a close the design stand. I don't know if you agree, or well, the evidence is not conclusive. But, yeah. Uh, it seems a lot The problem with carotid standing is the embolization. Yeah. Procedural and post-procedural. So uh, the smaller the stent uh, cells are, the, the less likely is embolization than the, the new stents with uh, the nitinal mesh inside, yeah, yeah. which could also prove uh, promising. But uh, as but, you said, yeah. the problem is that it's with the available for... evidence, carotid enterotrectomy, particularly in symptomatic patient, is superior because it, it gives less, at least less minor strokes. And if you, you, know, you put your, ha ha uh, your hand on your heart, you cannot say that giving the patient a higher rate of minor stroke is something that you can neglect. So the patient, if is uh, at normal risk for surgery, should undergo surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, cerebral protection device, you talk about this. Uh, I, will I will be interested to come back to this. Do you recommend? The use of them, because there was so much, uh, so much this discussion about interventionists. Yes, I think Eugenio has a lot of experience and has published a lot of literature. They certainly reduce uh, MRI lesions, but in clinical practice, as as he showed in that case, uh, yeah, we we have this this missed link because yeah. Yeah. when I started to work, uh, the use of a protection device was already in the practice. Yeah. But we, I already did this use, but we don't have a randomized trial. Okay. Uh, but now the problem is that who of you wants to conduct a randomized trial of comparison of using or not a, a protection device? Yeah. Maybe it's too risky. So whoever is working he knows that uh, using the proximal protection, you find a lot of material. Uh, sometimes when you do carotid with distal protection, you see slow flow, and then if it's a slow flow, after the post dilation means that somebody embolizes in the filter, and then you remove the filter, and the flow comes back to normal. So who wants to take this risk? Yes, but nobody knows if it's really uh, useful. This, this is a problem. All cardiologists do use uh, cerebral protection yeah. in all patients, but in the experience of uh, uh, Mainly of the interventional radiologists, they, were, they had some complications because they were not used uh, to use a to, to use a filter. filter. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a complication because Probably of the filter, if you know how to use it, it, it I mean, it's not a dangerous device. But the, to give you the definite answer, <coughs> we need a randomized trial. I doubt that somebody will ever run this kind of trial. So what about? Okay. So we have a distal filter device, a flow reversal uh, with a different few filters. Uh, I will skip this. 
Uh, skip this two. So, in fact, I want to conclude on this. I think the, the first thing is in symptomatic patient is the best medical therapy and risk factors control is mandated in all patient. Recently, symptomatic uh, patient benefit from uh, surgical treatment in the early time period after a set of symptoms. So you should remember this. Take care of this patient as soon as possible. If uh, CTA show no large infarct, go quickly. And then uh, the, ben the beneficial role of carotene autotomy is supported by level on one evidence in the symptomatic patient if performed early with a low operative risk. Thank you.